I started out as I started out as a as a kid. The first time I picked up a book, uh, my eyes hurt when I read, and I loved to read, but my eyes always hurt. And uh, you know, mom took me to doctors and things, and and there, there wasn't anything wrong. So they told me, well, you like to read a lot, kids, so your eyes hurt. And and I thought that was the case for everyone. That everyone who read a lot, their eyes hurt a lot. And um, and that went on, you know. And uh, one day when I was a teenager. I accidentally found some relief. I went to the library and the book I wanted wasn't available except for in this newer, larger print edition. It was the first time they had these. And when I read it, I found I could read faster and I didn't hurt, my eyes didn't hurt as much. And I checked that book out over and over. And I, the librarian would hold these books for me whenever they came in. So that was the first time I, I had kind of some relief. I went to college, I went to a large university and my vision basically collapsed uh, during my first quarter, my first exams. My eyes locked in place. I, I remember seeing my, my exam in double vision and trying to complete it. Uh, there was a, a school of optometry on campus and I went to the doctors there for over a year and a half. They tried everything. Um, to give me some relief. And uh, finally, they sent me to a researcher. They had a neurologist who was doing some research there. And he diagnosed me with a very rare uh, neurological uh, vision disorder. They said only six other people in history uh, have, of books that recorded these things had ever had it. And they also said I had dyslexia. So for the first time, we knew why I was having pain and why I was struggling with reading. Um, and, but there wasn't really a uh, a way to fix it at that point. Um, so I began looking for my own adaptations. Um, I went to, there was a, 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 a group for the people who were blind students. I went to them and talked to them and they told me about books on tape, which I did qualify for. So for the, I got books that I could listen to. And I used to ask my professors, would they, um, it helped me prioritize the reading. We had a huge reading load. And, uh, and, and I'd say to them, you know, if I, I'll try and read everything, but my eyes are going to lock up at some point. So if you tell me what to read first, and some would do it, some wouldn't. And I would go to the, the department secretaries. They had something new called a Xerox that would enlarge uh, papers. So they would enlarge my exams for the first time to great big print so that maybe I would get through the finals. Um, it took me nine years. I, I went to college and law school, actually. Um, it was a lot of pain, <laughs> but I did it and I was successful. And I actually practiced law for 10 years. Uh, I found success as a prosecutor. I wasn't able to do a more conventional law practice that had a lot of reading and research, but I did better in, in court when I could think on my feet feet. Uh, when my youngest daughter was born, uh, she was ill, and I took leave at that point, and she was eventually diagnosed with uh, cerebral palsy, later with autism, and pretty much every learning disability you could imagine, including the same neurological disorder that I had, very severe dyslexia. She saw the whole world in a mirror, and uh, she also had three hearing, different hearing impairments. So I um, worked with her and a team of specialists, you know, her whole, whole time growing up, and I became very familiar with good ways to approach vision challenges using a combination of uh, read out loud software, something called screen reader software, magnification software, and large print. About 13 years ago, I woke up um, one day blind in one eye. I had been taking a new medication and I had a terrible reaction to it. And uh, my brain was under attack by my immune system. And uh, not just my eyes were affected, I was physically ill, but um, that was the most pronounced uh, reaction. One month later, I lost the sight in my second eye. And at that point, I was declared legally blind. I had uh, grays and blacks and a little light and some blurry motion for my sight. I couldn't see my children anymore. And I underwent uh, blind rehabilitation training. I learned Braille. It took about a year and a half to, to get the basics down and how to use screen reader software and magnification and how to, how to use a sight cane. And uh, because I was physically impaired as well, I, I used a wheelchair at times. So uh, while I was in the hospital, I said to my husband, bring me something to do. I was in the hospital for a long time and uh, the kids, had, it was the holidays and they'd gotten uh, some round knitting looms from their aunt, from their aunt. And so he brought me those and I knit and I knit and I knit, um, but you know, I couldn't see any patterns. So I made them up in my head and that actually was the start of my designing career. 
And since then, I've published over 150 patterns uh, for loom knitters, and I've written two stitch dictionaries for loom knitters. I wrote the first stitch dictionary, and I've edited a few charity collections, and more recently, I've been teaching master classes on loom knitting technique. But uh, you're here to learn about accessibility, but I wanted you to know how I got here, how I became an accessibility consultant, what I, what I come from, because I think I've got an unusual uh, uh, slant on things. So when I would write patterns, I had to write them in a format that I could use myself, and, and this was an accessible format. And I thought early on people would complain. They'd say, why are you writing these patterns? They're so plain and they've got great big letters. Instead, I started getting people telling me, thank you, your patterns are really easy to understand. You know, you write such clear patterns. And I thought, you know, I'm a brand new self-taught uh, designer. I didn't even call myself a designer early on. I'm not sure that I'm the, that it's the, my writing that's that good. But I felt that it was how they were presented. You know, I knew from my daughter about processing issues. And I thought that format's making a difference. So I knew it was helping people. So what I wrote, uh, the way I presented my patterns, it was very plain, um, all black text in a single column, uh, aerial text, which is uh, what they call sans serif, all the little feet and, and wingdings are taken off of the text. It's very smooth. And uh, 24 point font, which is actually quite large. Um, in the publishing industry, 14 to 18 font is considered large print. So this is quite large 24 font point font. I'll show you some examples a little later on. And the big deal was all the directions were written out. I, I couldn't see a chart, certainly, and I couldn't use charting software at that time. So it made these very easy to use, easy to read. And also, if you were using a screen reader, they were a little easier to use. So uh, time goes by, and I'm, I'm plugging along. <laughs> and uh, I was very active on Ravelry at that time. And Ravelry added a search tag to their database for low vision patterns. About three years ago, they did this. And I leapt at the chance to see if we could get other designers maybe to get interested in writing patterns in an accessible format. Um, I started the Accessible Patterns Group and we really had some great discussions about what accessibility should look like. Um, and this was happening between designers as well as people who needed an accessible pattern format. And at Later on, Ravelry decided they had to uh, define what this low vision tag looked like. It wasn't really a great name, low vision. There's not really a, a low vision diagnosis, but this is the umbrella we had and, and we worked with it. And uh, they came to me and they said, what should these patterns look like? And I gave them my top 10 list of, of things and they chose five and they chose pretty well, um, which was all black text, 22 to 24 point font, uh, the sans serif font, that smooth font, no italics, and all the directions had to be written out. And if a chart was part of the pattern, the pattern had to be able to um, be read and made without the chart. So that was how we started out. And this is kind of the baseline when I teach about designers about accessible patterns. That's kind of the baseline pattern that we work with. And initially, um, there was not uh, nothing about screen readers for, for this to make the patterns accessible for a screen reader. But the group was discussing it. The Accessible Patterns group was discussing this. And there were designers who wanted right away to make patterns that could be read clearly by a screen reader. And, and that's kind of where my expertise came in and all my experience. And we talked about how that could be done. And Ravelry agreed that we could put screen reader patterns under that, that low vision umbrella. So what I did is I started to encourage uh, designers to eliminate abbreviations. You know, um, knitting and crochet patterns are very, they're a technical document with all that uh, abbreviation in them. And uh, screen reader software, the software just reads literally what's in front of it. So when you have all those abbreviations, it comes out really garbled. And it also skips a lot of things like brackets and asterisks and parentheses. So the repeats are hidden from the user. So up until this point, all of the blind resources, which provided um, some braille and provided some audio, um, there's some special libraries here in the US. Bec uh, up until that point, if they translated a book, they didn't accommodate for those abbreviations. In other words, it was just a literal translation. And you'd be listening to the book and it would say, repeat chart rows one through six. And of course you couldn't, but that was it. The chart rows weren't available. You were supposed to refer to a chart that you can't see. So for the first time, 
uh, we started having these, these new patterns where we're writing out the chart directions. And uh, another thing that was fortuitous was about that time, um, charting software was available to designers and free. Some of it was free. And the charting software would generate written directions from the chart. So for designers who like to design using a chart, all of a sudden they didn't have to write all the directions out. They could just use the software to generate it. So, so this was really working well for us. And we had about 500 patterns in the database. And then unfortunately, Ravelry changed its site, its format. Um, and that created a lot of difficulty for the very community that we're working with. And, and all of a sudden, this is the only place, this is the only database where we have all these patterns listed. And, and for many of us, um, like me, it was very difficult to use Ravelry at that point. So I realized we needed to do something to make these patterns available that people would know about them. So um, I started what's called the Accessible Patterns Index. It's accessiblepatternsindex.com. And the idea was that we would have a complete accessible list of these resources for anyone in an accessible format. And, uh, and in particular, the first thing we did was we listed the designers. And um, at this point, it's a slow process because I'm slow and I'm the only one at this point doing the input, but we've got um, braille collections in there. We've got large print collections in there, and we've got all these designers who've been creating these wonderful accessible patterns for the last few years. So those are all being put into that index and it's supported by donations. And, um, and so far, I think we've got about three years, we've, we've got the first three years. So we've, we've had, it's been around about a year, and we've got another two years paid for. So, so we're doing okay. So we're very pleased to have that. So um, who is using these patterns? Well, really, a lot of people are using them, um, people who are blind and partially sighted. And people with dyslexia actually really do well with these patterns, but also people who consider themselves neurodivergence, people who might be ADHD or ADD, or who have difficulty processing printed information. And that's a lot of different people. Um, people who don't like to read charts or un are unable to read charts really like them because all the directions are written out. Um, older people who are suffering from things like macular degeneration or vision loss from diabetes, you know, the list really goes on and on, and I'm hoping that. Great. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, we just paused for the recording, uh, but I'll, so anyway, I was thinking if you're here, you know, maybe you need you're interested in the patterns, or you know someone who's interested in the patterns, or you work with people who might be able to use them. I found that when I talk to people, we're usually someone knows someone or has a way. It's you're just not too far off from finding someone who might be help, helped by a pattern like this. So the exciting thing that happened um, in this last year that I want to talk about and I've been involved with is that um, I approached publications. I started approaching magazines saying, how about making accessible magazines? Some would be interested and then I'd never hear from them again. But two, two wonderful magazines decided to go ahead and do this. And so um, the first one is, I'm holding up, it's Making Stories. And they're here at India Untangled, by the way. So you can go over and take a look. And um, we've done two full issues. Everything in the issue was made accessible in an accessible format. Now this is done in, in digital format because they become very big magazines when we do this. And uh, for making stories, it's really terrific because they relied heavily on very complicated charts. So this was really, um, really terrific to be able to do it. And so what the magazine and what it looks like is, um, oh, by the way, it's, I, if I didn't say it already, it's issues five and six that have the accessible format. And if you get the print issue or get the digital, whichever version you buy, you get the accessible issue as well. So you'll, it'll sound familiar, the format, it's all black text uh, in a single column, 22 point Verdana text, which is a lovely text to read, fully written out directions, um, very minimal uh, abbreviations. So it reads clearly. I've listened to every word. I make sure that everything reads very clearly before we, we publish it. Um, so, and all the charts have been fully incorporated into the written directions. Um, the other thing we do is we put in um, something we call anchor directions so that you get a very linear presentation. In other words, whereas normally in patterns like this, you might be told you're on 
row 45 and it tells you to go back and, and work row two and three, we won't do that. We put row two and three in. So you get a very sequential order or we let you know ahead of time if the repeat is coming up instead of after the fact. Um, that really helps somebody who's using a screen reader because it's hard to go back and find where, where that row is. So um, that's worked beautifully. Uh, and then um, just in the last few weeks, the second magazine um, came out and I'm holding it up here. It's Murat magazine. If you haven't seen it yet, it's a crochet magazine. I kind of love that we've got one knitting and one crochet magazine. And um, Murat, uh, they're actually kind of sister magazines. I think Murat, you can even get them from um, making stories. So Murat magazine is coming out of Scotland and uh, Alison Chu is the um, is the editor. And I approached Allison when I, I saw on Instagram that this magazine was starting and she was very interested in accessibility and she was getting ready to do her Kickstarter. And I said to her, you know, think about building accessibility in as part of this, as part of the magazine. And she did. And I think it was really successful. I know her Kickstarter, she funded like the first issue, like in a week or week and a half. It was just amazing. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And we saw a lot of comments about people who were really happy to see accessibility being front and center and part of this new, new publication. And then I um, met with Allison and she has a great team of tech editors uh, last April. And I, I trained them a little bit, told them what accessibility Accessibility looks like or could look like. And I love to, when I work with designers, I tend to push them. I always tell them to do more. And a lot of them, you know, they have to tell me, okay, no, no, stop. This is my limit. But um, Allison and her team, they got really excited about it. So they did things that we've never, not only are we seeing these, these accessible magazines that we've never seen before, but they took it a step further. So they actually have, more it has, two accessible issues, not just one. So they have one that's the large print, kind of what I like to call the easy to read issue. Um, that's like that original what Ravelry had. So it still has the abbreviations in it, but it's just so nice to read it. And it includes everything that the uh, print magazine has that, you know, all of that's in there. The other thing they did is Sharon Carter, um, who was one of the tech editors also was, was creating the charts. So she worked me with me and we created accessible, easy to read charts. So for the first time, we've got charts that are just larger and, and they're, they're just clearer, but also they went a step further and made them colorblind uh, accessible. So for the color work charts, it worked very hard on that. And then Allison um, was drawing the schematics for the magazine. So she created easy to see schematics. So, and that's, so that's in both issues. And so the second um, version of accessible is just for screen readers. And so that one has all of the all of the abbreviations removed. It still contains everything else because we thought there might be sighted people who still like to see something without the abbreviations. So it's really, it's really cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up um, real quick. Give me a second here because it takes me a minute to um, hang on a second here. Am I able to share screen? I'm trying to see. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm not, I was hoping to show you. I just gave you access, Renee. Did you? Thank you so much. Okay. No problem. So, so let's see if I pull this up. All right. I'm sorry, I don't see well enough to do this. If I wanna share screen, how am I? There it is. Okay, thank you. Sorry guys, you have to, the small zoom is still very small for me to see. So let's see, here we go. So just wanted you to see what this looked like. So this is a little example from, um, from, uh, moor it and this is just showing you like an introduction to a pattern this would be the just the easy to read large print so you're getting a feeling of what this looks like in the the 24 point aerial and everything's spaced out nicely but it's still si similar to the original pattern we haven't made a lot of changes and then here is um what it looks like this was a color work pattern and you can see what one of the things we just space out everything and we bold those rows so they're easy to find and keep track of. And then here it is in the, um, the screen reader version. So now it, you might have noticed in the, the um, original version, it had brackets to represent the repeats. And of course, brackets are a visual cue. So we've taken those out. And so it tells the screen reader, instead it's got a, a verbal cue. So it says, instead of repeat, it's at a visual repeat cue, it says work. 
So it's telling you, it'll, sometimes it'll say repeat, sometimes it'll say work. So this is, it expands the pattern quite a bit, but the screen reader is gonna read this perfectly clearly for, for the person who's not sighted. And then this is a sample from, um, uh, from the other magazine from Making Stories. So this is a knitting example. And they keep a few of the abbreviations in. That was, everybody's got a little bit, you know, editorial <laughs> comment on there. But here you can see, um, this was uh, this first uh, round 10. It was two over two left cross pearl. That originally was a two backslash two LPC. The screen reader cannot read that at all. So that's been expanded. And then over here, we even change things like you see where it says P2 for Perl 2. Originally, that was um, a lowercase p, and screen readers see that as page 2. So you get some of the difficulties that people had following these. So we've, re we've changed everything. The, the, uh, the punctuation gets changed. Here uh, in the second row, you can see where the repeat is changed a little bit. Um, it says Perl to P2, then repeat. K2, P4, three times. So lots of things have changed to make it understandable when the screen reader is looking at it. So I just wanted you to get a feeling of what those look like. All right, I'm going to stop sharing for the minute. There we go. Um, so uh, one other thing I wanna mention, um, about Ravelry, and I, I, I know that they're not, it's not the most popular place right now, but it is still, um, the main place repository of these patterns. So I had asked them early on if we could have um, search tags for a uh, screen reader and also for two formats for braille. One is the uh, press braille it's called, which would be a physical braille book. And the other is a digital braille as well as audio books. And um, they at first they didn't do it, but last year they did. we did get these. And um, that digital braille is kind of interesting because it's an area we're hoping to expand these accessible patterns into. Digital braille machines are very expensive. They're very costly and prohibitive, but uh, the National Library Service for the Blind here in the U.S. is beta testing them, and it's very possible that they will start distributing them for free to all of their patrons. And if that happens, then we can make our patterns available to people as well in that format, which will be very exciting. So that's one area of expansion I hope to see. Um, audio it, right now, it's just audio books, so we haven't really been able to make um, those patterns accessible yet, but we're hoping. The other thing Ravelry did is they made me um, a special editor for the patterns. That's called a super editor, and what that allows me to do is I kind of babysit these patterns, and I what we do is every pattern, and this is also on the Accessible Patterns Index as well, every pattern has to have what's called an accessibility statement that tells you in the pattern notes exactly what features that pattern has. So it tells you about, you know, that 24 point font, uh, what sans serif, maybe what, what they've used, because sometimes there's a font that some people don't like to read. And it, it, it goes through all the requirements. And if it's a screen reader pattern, it tells you um, what type of accommodations they've made, if they've gotten rid of all the abbreviations, or if there's still some that are garbled. And, uh, and it tells you how they've tested it. They're required to have tested it in some way and had to have it evaluated. So that accessibility statements kind of become the standard. It's an extra step that the, the designers have to do, but we look for it and really I go through those patterns and make sure it's, it's there. So some other areas of um, accessibility I'd like to tell you about is, um, well, the next to our colorblind accessibility and captioned videos. These were tags I asked for Ravelry uh, recently, and now they kind of got on the bandwagon. We got those the next day, which was terrific. I asked for colorblind accessibility because I did notice there were designers who were, who were saying their patterns were colorblind accessible. Um, did some research, this wasn't an area at the time I knew a lot about, and it turns out that there's about 12 different kinds of colorblind accessibility and they all have different needs. So this is another one where uh, we're encouraging the designers to do it, but we're making them put that accessibility statement in so that um, 
people know if it's actually going to suit their particular need. I, I see it as a growing area, um, starting to include these patterns over the accessible patterns index. Um, but it, this is an area that's, that's very interesting and designers are getting on board with it, um, the ones that are interested in accessibility. So I'm excited about that. Captioned video, um, it turned out that this is an area that, that we didn't need a lot of encouragement um, because most of the videos are hosted on YouTube and YouTube and Zoom and uh, Google Groups, other of these, they're, uh, they are allowing captioning and they're including it more and more. Um, but there are designers who also do more professional captioning, which is nice. And then they can use this tag and tell you about it, hopefully. So that's not when I babysit too much, but it is there. Um, the next area I want to talk a little bit about um, is people, the physical needs side of things. Um, you know, I, I ended up using loom knitting because I couldn't grab uh, grasp the crochet hook or knitting needles anymore. And uh, when I started working with this population and designing for them, I found that pretty much everyone who was a loom knitter had either a processing disorder, they couldn't read patterns, or they had a physical disorder, their hands, their arms, fingers, that, that made them come to looms as an adaptive tool. And it's been a great adaptive tool for people. Um, so I know that, that. now in the, the crochet area, for a long time, we've certainly had a number of ergonomic uh, uh, hooks available. So that's been better. But uh, unfortunately, in needles, there has not been as much adaptation um, available. And, and, and so I hope to see that improve. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about it because I loom knitting is what I'm more familiar about is there's a great company called Cindy Wood Looms. And they've in the last few years made adaptive looms. And these are really wonderful. They actually have a little extra uh, piece of wood and expansion to them that allows you to take a clamp and they actually come with the clamp and you can clamp it to a table or the arm of a chair or the arm of a wheelchair and it holds the loom stable and it's wonderful for people who can only use one hand so that's been a terrific tool and um so that's you know we do see small um areas of inclusion if you have more questions on physical needs ask me um and i might be able to answer it isn't an area that i work with as much um for I've done some reviews like on these adaptive looms, but I have it's not an area that I work with as much in my in my business. Um, size inclusivity, I, I have a feeling many of you might be interested in that. Um, so both Moret and Making Stories are doing uh, sizes, uh, their sweaters are in 10 sizes. And I'm happy to say that the people who are writing accessible patterns, I see so many of them are also being size inclusive. They're really working hard to do this. What concerns me when I monitor discussions about designers who aren't doing this yet is that there, there's a bias, there's a size bias, there's a bias against the disabled, and there's this, well, show me up front that I'm going to make money attitude that I really find worrisome. And I think this is, you know, this, first of all, the profit argument's been showed, shown over and over in areas of accessibility not to be valid because you know, when they put ramps on buildings, there was a huge outcry that you would spend money to have ramps on buildings. And now people can't live without ramps on buildings. You know, anyone who's, anyone, everyone uses it. It's not just for wheelchairs. You, know, you think of every delivery person, all kinds of reasons that we have ramps on buildings. And so the cost just becomes part of the normal. You know, it's like saying, well, we won't have doors on buildings or we won't have two doors or an extra exit door on buildings or we won't have uh, you know, fire escapes on buildings. This is just part of what becomes the normal. And, and that's what has to happen. And I think it will only happen if, if we ask for it more and more and if we support the designers who are already doing it. So you could go to Accessible Patterns Index, this would be what I would ask you, and pick a designer and support them. Tell them that you like what they're doing. If you don't need an accessible pattern, maybe there's one there that you'd like to get and let them know you did it because that you found them through Accessible Patterns Index. You know, they need to hear it. The magazines in particular need to hear it, the two magazines, because they are the only magazines that I'm ever aware of that have done this. 
I mean, of any kind, not just of a knitting magazine, but of any kind, it's actually more difficult for them to do it because patterns are much more difficult. If we just had text, it's not that difficult to create an accessible version, but these patterns take time. It's a lot of work to do. And, um, you know, it's worrisome to them. It's it's hard for them to see that people are using it. So they need to hear that, you know, that, you know, that you like it. That the, so I my, my ask for you today is if you would do that, it would be really wonderful. Uh, another area um, that's kind of new and, and uh, isn't talked about very much are medical patterns. And um, I'm actually over at Ravelry, I'm the special editor for medical patterns. This was um, something that we had to work hard for. And what I mean by medical patterns is uh, medical patterns that are patterns that create an item that has a medical use. And we had to fight um, very hard. The Accessible Patterns Group had to really fight hard with Ravelry to convince them that we have a, a medical category and some search tags that uh, work with different attributes of medical items. Um, so there might be items that are therapeutic toys, for example, and, and things like that. So some of the items, just to give you an example, are um, prosthetic breasts. And these are, they're typically called knitted knockers, but there's crochet knockers and loom knitted knockers. Um, socks that go over an amputee's arm or leg, uh, special toys for neonatal infants, um, fidget muffs for those with dementia. Those are just a few of the items. Some One I saw recently that I thought was wonderful, it was a cowl. And the other editors were going, well, that's just a cowl. It doesn't get to be in this special stands, standard, but it had been made by a nurse. And the nurse had made it and said in such a way that it would cover someone who had a port in their neck. And I remembered when I'd been in the hospital, I'd at one point had a port in my neck and I thought, oh, how nice it would have been to have something to cover it. So sometimes it can be a, something that we use every day, but it, it has a use as well and it becomes a medical use. My fight with Ravelry was that we should be, you know, if you are making an item for someone in the family who's ill or for, you, for yourself, you should be able to find it easily. We shouldn't have to search for them in, in a million patterns to find them. We should be able to find them easily. Um, right now, these patterns typically are being made by people who are making them for themselves or for a family member. I'm hoping that as designers become more aware of these areas, um, that they will design more for them, but there seems to be a real bias against them. And, and, I'm, and so those are patterns I also babysit and, and hope take care of those entries on the Ravelry. I've done a little work uh, with some websites and knitting software. Uh, this is an upside, this is an uphill battle, unfortunately, even though we have standards for this in the US, um, more and more what I see are websites that are becoming inaccessible to somebody like me. Um, you know, when I run my special software, um, the pop-ups and everything else with my magnification, I end up with maybe an inch, maybe I can get a line of text in there because of all the monetization that's going on. Um, and even when I can see it, typically things are done in light gray on gray backgrounds, things like that. So um, another thing that happens is we get these accessible patterns going and we, uh, we, we, we get them to a site and the designer's um, shopping cart is inaccessible. So that's, you know, these are, it just becomes very uh, difficult to make the whole process work. Um, as a matter of fact, that happened with uh, making stories. The first thing we had was um, I, I let the blind crafters know we're several big blind crafting groups. They're so active and they went over to buy it and they couldn't find the shopping cart. So we had to redo the page so that they could find it. And so it's, um, you know, it's, it's step by step. It's, it's a little difficult to do, uh, but we keep trying. We definitely keep trying. And uh, so the other thing, uh, so these websites, again, this is the kind of thing where you have to say, make it easier for me to see. Um, when we built Accessible Patterns Index, um, it's expensive because I went with um, WordPress.org, which had lots of accessibility um, templates that we could use, which worked very well. But things that I've noticed a lot of places like Squarespace don't. Um, they're free, they're easier for people to use, but they don't really have much in the way of accessibility available. And so this is, this is the challenge. Um, 
And for those of you who have sites and blogs and whatever, it's something to keep in mind um, that, that, that we love to go look at your stuff, but often we can't access it, especially if you're running a lot of ads and pop-ups, it becomes quite difficult. And then, you know, I want to just touch back again to say, um, if you can support what the designers are doing, this is such a, we're really at the beginning of this. And what worries me is that, especially since Ravelry has become so inaccessible, that, that lovely accessible patterns group um, has stopped having discussions. The people are gone and the people who were interested. And so we really haven't seen any new designers working on these patterns recently. The ones who are doing it are still continuing. We haven't seen any of the large designers who have teams who could do this really easily. They're not doing it. And um, other publications haven't been interested. And I think that's that's worrisome. I you know I don't want to see this stop. I want to see it move forward. And I think it's only going to happen if we ask for it. Um, I think I have talked really fast because I finished my notes, but I'm hoping you have some questions for me. <laughs> Were there questions in the chat? There were some general questions in the chat just about the uh, different sites that you mentioned. So I made sure to put the links in there for everything. Oh, um, okay. Including um, your site for the accessible patterns index.com, the making stories and the Sindwood looms as well. Uh, the Moritz site is also on there. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna, um, here, I'm gonna share Yes. put my page up too because you can here's where you can find me all the different places and you're most welcome to email me if you um especially for those of you i had a, I, this morning somebody asked because they were i was visiting in the lounge and they weren't going to be here so they're welcome to email me if you're watching this as a recording um you know this morning i had a great question on um whether or not we're gonna uh, whether or not I worked at all with um, price inclusion, whether price accessibility. Mm -hmm. And that's not an area that I work in specifically, but I do notice that the, the designers who are doing the accessible patterns more and more are doing this tiered pricing that they're trying very hard to make things size inclusive and uh, I mean price inclusive as well as size inclusive you know once you see a designer doing that they're looking at all of it so I see quite a few doing it um, and uh, you know I hope that's a trend that that people are doing um, you know it's hard of course because designers work hard and 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 need to be paid and when they're doing accessible patterns they're working extra hard um, you know they might be doing it on their own they might be um, paying for somebody like me to be it's like a tech editor for accessibility that's what that's what I do to review their patterns and so that's you know that's that all gets added in and uh, it's it's always a challenge for them yeah were there any other were there other questions I, I'm not able to see the chat so if you can help me out if there's anything I should answer there absolutely thanks yeah. Susie of course um I don't have any questions but I actually um you know we spoke a little bit this morning about the Ravelry site which you mentioned mm -hmm. and the accessibility issue with that and I find it interesting that you know, after the buzz from the initial launch of the new platform, it kind of died down, you know, they, they moved it to a classic button if one needed. And if you can just talk a little bit about where yeah. you see that moving towards, and, you know, since you're still working with them in some capacity, is that yeah. something that's so, come up? Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> I was... I, I guess for the people who, I, 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 if, if you're not familiar with it, we can talk more about that. But, you know, when it first happened, I have a, um, I have a, a seizure disorder. So I was one of the people who had seizures right away with the new, new platform. And I didn't even know why until I went back on a few days later and, and found out. And so it was quite difficult for me to use. So I was one of those people. And, uh, and it was, you know, scary to me. I was, I was very active there. I had all my patterns there. I was a moderator and it was very, you know, for, for a lot of dis those of us with disabilities, it had been very important, but we knew that a Ravelry was already inaccessible, that there'd been problems with it for years, especially for people who relied only on screen readers. For somebody like me, where I could use magnification as well, we got around. 
and, and there had been changes even a few years back at the time, um, just in, oh, I can't remember at the time, they changed a little bit about the background and some of the print, and it was really bothering people. And at the time they said, well, too bad, this is how we like it. So we kind of knew <laughs> we had problems. And we also had had that argument with them over the medical patterns. And on the, you know, on these, just what we're asking for is tags to search for medical patterns. I mean, it was the stupidest thing. Why is that? You know, they put that in and no, no problem. And, and sorry, I not, my grandmother used to always said, you don't say stupid, but <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like she just kicked me in my neck. Uh, it was very aggravating. And I finally said, just do the right thing. You know, this is, this is just ridiculous. And eventually they did, but it's, uh, it's frustrating. It's extremely frustrating, and um, I'm only able to use it now using some filters that uh, were written by one of the a wonderful member there, and I have to use it very limited amounts of time. So I go on there to um, to really to check those patterns. I'm babysitting that database, you know. Just I couldn't couldn't give it up. But it's it's been a real challenge um, for me, and uh, the limited amount of vision I have, the strain is used up by that. And I know our accessible patterns group, which was so active, it's just dead. It's just gone. Those people left, you know, so the people who were interested and frustrated or couldn't, couldn't, we, we just, it's really sad to see that. And also um, in the loom knitters group, we'd been quite active and it's been extremely quiet and you could just see it from the day when they stopped classic. I mean, you could just watch it happen that the disabled community really lost access. And, and I know that's not a big part of Ravelry, but it certainly was a big part of my life. And I know that that's, they're missing that. Yeah, yeah that is unfortunate. Um, and I know someone put a comment in there that says that whenever it gets brought up, it's kind of shut down, which is even more unfortunate. So oh, what do you think we, it, we could do as the larger community to kind of help hey, bring well, that I'll, back? I will tell you that we had a we had a Ravelry accessibility discussion group that was going on, making recommendations to Ravelry during this when we thought they would still make changes, and they actually took one of the moderators and banned her for ten days. They gave her no access to Ravelry, so that shut she left, and that took care of that group as well. So it was really really quite um, brutal. What can we do? Well, I think that we you know something like the accessible patterns index is is for this area is really going to be important um so you know making sure that that continues to grow <laughs> and but i think supporting these designers that's what i keep coming back to i really worry that they're not going to keep doing it that they're if they don't know that people want the patterns or see value in what they're doing whether it's size inclusion, whether it's the pricing, what, whatever it is that makes it accessible, they need to know that. But also we need to, you know, if we could get pub more publications to do this, even if it was just a few patterns, an issue, if they would do that, that sets a standard. That says to your designers, you know, that from now on, when you're submitting, we're going to, you're going to make an accessible pattern out of this. That will become, once that becomes the standard, you know, that sets the standard for everything else. If, if you have, you know, Pom Pom Quarterly or some of the other big ones doing this, um, you know, I think that then you get, you get that it, it becomes every, widespread, it becomes the norm. So that would be my hope. That would be my hope. But I'm yeah, always hoping. We, yeah, we're definitely seeing that with the size inclusivity lately, right? We, we're seeing more and more patterns going up, you know, to the four or five axes, which is amazing. Um, but a long time coming, right? So Ex I know that this is also going to be a fight. Well, well, I, you know, my first conversation when I was talking to uh, Hannah Lisa from the editor from uh, Making Stories, she was really upset that morning. And she said to me, I'm really upset because they just put out, must have been, maybe it was issue four, and they had a large size model. And she said she'd gotten complaints from people who said they didn't want to see a large size model. That wasn't aspirational. And I said, you know, I was looking at that magazine this morning and I said, it was so aspirational. I said, for the first time, I saw a sweater and thought, that could fit me. I said, so I had completely the other reaction. 
and her hearing that erase that that negativity and you know so that's why I feel like they really do need to hear from us they don't hear from us much they get the complaints they get the is this wrong did you make an error in the pattern but they don't get the other stuff mm-hmm. and and I think every time we say to them we want to see models that look like us we want to see models that look like everybody when we want patterns that got the size inclusive done. and you know the other thing about the size inclusive is you know, all this charting software and all that made it a lot easier. I mean, it, you know, they didn't have to, you know, it, it was, it's out there. So once you can learn it, it's not that difficult to do. Um, you know, and I understand that there's designers who don't know how to do it yet. And my feeling is, well, they should do it or they shouldn't publish those patterns. Um, I'm one of those. I don't know how to scale up enough on a, on a garment. So I don't do garments and I try and make everything else I do as variable as possible. Um, and when people call, uh, write to me and say that, I, I will sit there and figure out how to make it for their size, you know, so I try very hard to do that. I think I'm, I don't know, there's some people like me and there's others who don't. So, um, but I think, you know, when they hear it from us, it makes a big difference. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Does anyone have any questions for Renee? This is such an interesting topic for me um, as someone who's has been in the past diagnosed with macular degeneration. You know, my sight is always something that I kind of cherish because you just never know. So um, your story is not only interesting, but it's also inspiring. I can't imagine having to learn Braille at this point in my life. It was, it was, it was, you know, it was really interesting. The, um, they sent a woman to my house and it was, there was a social worker at the hospital who, and she said, I'm going to get you this woman. She's not exactly in your area, but I'm going to ask her to come because she's really good. And she just sat there and she said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to learn Braille and you're going to learn to be a housewife again. And I actually, um, at that time I was teaching and I was going to go get my credential. And um, what they did decide that is that I they wouldn't train me for that. So they cut me off. It was very interesting how that decision was made at the time. And I said to them, well, you know, I've been um, writing and publishing these patterns. And they're like, oh, we're not going to work with you. Because normally they would have taught me marketing and, and things like that, given me that digital Braille display and all of that. And so they they cut me off at um, Housewife. <laughs> so I was, was trained to do all the things around the house. Um, I told them I didn't want to learn how to iron, but everything else I learned and, and take care of my children and cook again and all of those things. Um, Braille uh, I, was interesting, but I did okay with it. I was dyslexic in Braille as I was in real life. Life was interesting. That is interesting. It was interesting. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of things I faced over it, but yeah, you know, that it's not, it's very, you can do it. And, you know, she just sat me down and said, you're going to do this. And I said, okay, I'll do that. What are you, what what are you going to do? I'm sure it was like learning a new language, right? So it was just those, those steps of just having to sit and practice and, and learn it. Exactly. Yeah. And so do you write your patterns in Braille as well? No, I, you know, I was, I was a touch typist. So I, I type, um, and, or I write them out. I can still see, I have a big magnifier. I guess you can't see it in the room, but off to my side, I have a big magnifier and I'm working on, I'm seeing you on a giant screen and everything's magnified. So I work, I still work with a lot of magnification. Um, my eyes, one of my eyes healed later on a couple of years in uh, quite a bit. So that helped me. So I'm able to, to work more with the magnification. And unfortunately, um, I ended up with mul- uh, multiple sclerosis. So my hands, my fingers don't have the sensitivity I need for Braille as well. Um, so I don't, I'm not able to, to do Braille quite as well as uh, I would like to. So um, that was, it's all, everything's a little challenge. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. No problem. I'm, I'm glad to, to offer you, if you ever want to talk macular, it's, it's, it's always a challenge. It's scary to lose your sight. Yeah, it's scary to to have to even, you know, just figure out like, okay, is that a new floater? Is that is is that always been there? Is that what is that? Is that just me being tired or is that actual issue? And, yeah. Well yeah. you get um well that's why I have my big organizer behind me. I I'm like everything has to have its place. A place and I right, have to know right. where it is. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Um, I will tell you that the um, the blind crafters, uh, the American Council for the Blind, they have the most active crafters. They've got classes going on every single day oh, wow. uh, in everything you could imagine. Um, a lot of them come and take my classes as well. They are fabulous. Crafting does not stop when you lose your sight. I, I, ha I have to tell you, they really were fabulous. Um, when I first uh, lost my sight, I was listening in and, and a lot to, um, there was a Google group of blind stitchers, they called themselves. And uh, they were just wonderful. They were so inspirational. So any, I know I, I can see that. Are we doing okay in chat? I didn't know. I don't want to miss it. Sorry. Yep. I can't see. Okay. No, we're doing okay with the chat. You guys got more questions for me? Yeah. I, I, I practiced this over and over, but I think I got nervous and talked really fast because I, I, every time I was at 45 minutes and we'd have 15 minutes of, mm -hmm. but I'm happy to talk with you about anything. <laughs> so yeah, I thought your pace was fine. It's definitely really interesting. Good. Um, I uh, just wanted to put in the uh, chat the link to the um, uh, site that you just mentioned. Um, it what is it the American Association for the Blind? Is oh, that American American Council for the Blind. American Council for the Blind. Yeah, so I'll they're put really that in the terrific. Chat as well. And in actually National Federation for the Blind also has a crafting division. They spell it with K, <laughs> they're crafting. Um, but American Council for the Blind seems to be really active right now. And they have knitting, crochet, and loom knitting classes going on all the time. Um, they're just they're just amazing, uh, the crafters over there. Everybody's doing everything. And they do all kinds of other classes too. They're working on all their, um, all their holiday crafts right now. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And, uh, I, I have to tell you, I, I've done some podcast interviews for them. And when they, um, when I was explaining to them what we're doing with the patterns and that the pat and, and at first they were kind of lukewarm. And I said, you're going to, I said, you're going to be able to understand the patterns. And finally, I just said, I read out what we've done, that these screen reader patterns are actually clear. And they were like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, this is just, it's just never been done before. And yeah. so it's really something. Um, when I, I remember talking with Hannah Lisa about why, you know, she wanted to do the accessible magazine. And she said that she'd never thought about it before, but she said, we're working on all this content. And then there's this whole part of the population that doesn't have access to it. And it's like, why wouldn't we make it available? And of course, you know, it's, it's just, it's costly. It's hard. You know, I think they think it's going to be easier and it's a great big magazine with complicated patterns. So, you know, I hope that they're able to keep doing it at it, it, both magazines. It's, you know, it's so exciting that they started, but at least we have, we have, we have this start and that's, and that's a great place to be. That's, uh, you know, two more books. I think of them like books are so big. It's two more books that, that we didn't have. And, and so that's mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So someone just came in late and they're asking the names of the magazines. Oh, okay. It's um, Making Stories. <laughs> Issues five and six are accessible and they're here at Indy. They're at Indy Untangled. Um, mm -hmm. Although I think they're presenting a pattern. That pattern is not part of these issues. So it wasn't, it's not in an accessible format, but the issues are. So if you get either of the issues, um, they come with the accessible version. And then the other one is the brand new magazine, More It, which is the crochet magazine. I so wish I could crochet because I, I want to make that cover. <laughs> <laughs> it is beautiful. It's really beautiful. I, um, God, I was, I was so wishing I could hold a crochet hook again. So More It is M-O-O-R-I-T. And, um, and they actually have the, they're the one that have the two accessible versions. So mm -hmm. it's really cool. I think it will meet the needs of most people just about anyone who has a vision problem. If they don't, I want to hear it because we're really working hard to make it happen. And I saw that they have not only the print version, but the digital version. I assume the digital version is also accessible. It, it's the digital version that is accessible. A print, a print version, now you could print it out. Um, and, and actually we set it up, but it's, they're big. They become really large, these patterns, you know, some of them got to 70, 80 pages. Mm -hmm. So what we do is when you get it, you get a whole bunch of files. So you get the main pattern file um, and that has all the articles. And in more, there's actually even a little embroidery um, that's done in there. And then you get um, two, two separate files. One is the large print, easy to read. And the other is the screen reader, easy to read. And each one has, a, they have the file for each pattern. And uh, there's an abbreviation file because there's different, the abbreviations are different 
for each one. I decided to put the abbreviation separately because I thought sometimes it's nice to just have that whole list and be able to get to it. So you could print all of them out if you want to, but they are long, but it's, it's perfect. You're perfectly, you, they're in a PDF format. That's very easy. So you can print these out, but it would have been prohibitive. You know, the magazines are right at the limit. These are, you know, they're shipped internationally. And so my understanding is in the print versions you see now, they're at their limit for, I think they're about 140 pages and wow. for weight and size. So what makes us, we're able to do the accessible versions because we can do them digitally. And that's how the designers are doing it for the most part is when you purchase the pattern, you get the accessible versions along with the regular version. There's a few I've seen maybe who do it separately, but I would say 99%. It's just like an extra file. You know, if you were on Ravelry and downloading it, it's an extra file that you get. So you get both versions. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's see if we have any more questions. And then if you don't mind putting up your information again. Okay, I sure will. But let's see. Come on, guys, some more questions. <laughs> yeah, some more questions. And then just a reminder that Renee's site with all the accessible patterns, um, it is um, accessiblepatternsindex.com. Yeah, I'm going to throw that up there right now. Here you go. Yeah, so right up there at the top. So it's accessiblepatternsindex.com. And uh, you can find me, uh, you can e feel free to email me. I'm rvanhoy at hotmail.com. Uh, I'm over on Instagram. I'm not super active, but I'm there. Uh, and I'm rvanhoy1. And over on Ravelry, I'm mom cook. So, so if you want to, if you like to um, send messages that way, I get them as emails. So I do see them easily. And then uh, if, if you were interested in loom knitting, I got you my loom knitting sites for you as well. And uh, I'm going to be, I'm only teaching one more class. Next Saturday is my last class for the year. I've done cl 10 classes plus this one. So I'm, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're available as recordings if you're interested in any of that. And then, and then we'll plan for next year. I'm not doing 10 classes next year, though. <laughs> I think I'm done. So. And classes is a lot. It was a lot. We, we, we thought, you know, Zoom is a wonderful thing and we'll do a class every month. And I kind of, <laughs> I must <must've> steam. <laughs> so it's, it's been a lot of fun. And actually I've had a, a whole a core group of blind loom knitters that have been taking the classes and, and the classes are accessible as well. Sure. So, so that's been fun. Um, and the, and I, they come with patterns that I've been putting together in accessible format. So that's, that's been a fun challenge and, and really enjoyable, good challenge for me. So that's uh, great. Yeah. Yeah. That's really great. All right. Okay. I don't see any more questions, but I know I thoroughly enjoyed this, Renee. So I thank you again for joining us this morning. And again, thank you for this lounge session. Um, was, I'll probably be, be reaching out to you personally. So oh, please do. <laughs> please do. I would love it. Anybody who would like to, I would love it. And if you're a designer, you know, just remember, feel free if you want help to reach out to me and let those other designers know. Please let them know you like what they're doing. It would be great. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Enjoy okay. the rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Katrina? Well, thank, thank you so much, Renee. That was so informative. And I really hope that Ravelry gets it together soon because I can't even use the site. So, and thank you so much for Susie for jumping in with the chat, uh, handling that session. Thank you so much. So is Lauren here? I'd like to introduce, introduce everyone to Lauren McElroy of Mother.